Right. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the Senate Cosmic Perspective and Dissenting Committee Chairman, Dr. Elan Kumaran, for uh, uh, inviting all of us uh, to conduct this important uh, session on instrument standardization. Uh, this is the most crucial part uh, when it comes to voting. Uh, we have with us a very uh, enlightened uh, panel of experts. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumaran will be chairing this session along with Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni. Uh, we have another senior uh, uh, practitioner, Dr. Kiran Puri. Welcome, sir. Uh, I'll be just giving you a brief introduction about all these speakers uh, before we go on to our uh, session. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumaran, again, uh, is a very well known uh, throughout India. He is a director at Priyanka Hospital Column in Kerala. He has been conducting hospital infection control programs for the past decade or so, both at the All India level and at the state level. And if you remember, we got a very uh, nice uh, scientific program from him uh, as a scientific committee chairman. Uh, uh, it was just uh, recently concluded. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, sir. We are very happy to uh, have you here to share Thank you. and learn from your experience. Uh, our co-chairman today, uh, before I go to the co-chairman, uh, we have Dr. Shuram KV, another uh, uh, senior consultant uh, practicing in Karnataka. Uh, he is the founder director at Ganesh uh, Netralia Facility Hospital at uh, Sirsi. He has a vast experience of more than uh, 25 years. And he has been passionate about uh, operation planning and maintenance. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, courses uh, together with him. Uh, welcome, Dr. Shuram, sir. Uh, and welcome you to this session and uh, you would uh, hear uh, from you from, and learn from you from your vast experience. Thank you. Thank you, Raju. Uh, then we have, uh, we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay Kulkarni, uh, who is our co chairman today. He is a microbiologist and an infection control consultant. He's not an ophthalmologist, but he has worked with a lot of ophthalmologists. And he knows the in and out of how to run an ophthalmic OT, and he understands the intricacies when it comes to ophthalmic uh, instrument stabilization. He has a vast experience of more than 25 years in uh, infection control uh, practices. Uh, he covers uh, and uh, gives consultations for more than 140 hospitals throughout India. He is a committee member and contributing author to the guidelines of implementation of the program of government of India. He has given numerous talks and he has been always been a part of, of the instrument process that I am a part of and uh, very happy to have you Dr. Uh, Sanjay Kulkarni sir. Uh, welcome you, to the you. session. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Sweet Sandhuja who is again uh, who, uh, my colleague at uh, RP Center. Uh, he is a veterinary surgeon. And he's working currently as a faculty and head of the Department of Ophthalmology at Kalpana Chawla Medical College in Karnal. Uh, uh, welcome, Smith, uh, to the uh, presentation. And uh, we have another uh, um, young uh, and budding uh, ophthalmologist, uh, Ophthalmology Patwardhan. Uh, she has uh, uh, been the backbone of the Dandadeep Eye Hospital, along with uh, Dr. Sorokar Kurzan. She heads the quality control and the NIBS uh, in Dandadeep Eye Hospital, which has got various other branches. Uh, other interests include TECO training of young trainees and NIBS preparation and quality control of the Welcome. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, with that, uh, uh, this is the brief overview of uh, what we'll be covering in this uh, session. Uh, so we'll be going uh, to the various talks. We'll be covering the steam sterilization, which I'll be covering it myself. Uh, then we'll have a separate uh, talk on how to clean the instrument and pack it. Dr. Rajesh Kumaran will be doing that. We'll go through the validation process uh, by Dr. Sumit and uh, safe supply uh, in logistics and OT by uh, Nidhi Bhutwarthan and ETO sterilization in the practice by Dr. Sanjay Kukarni, and how to use uh, correct stabilization equipment for your practice. Uh, this will be guided by Dr. 
Thank you. So I'll be going on to the uh, next talk. Uh, we'll start with the first talk. So before I start, let us begin with a small quiz here for the audience. So you may be having the autoclave in your hospital. So is it a horizontal autoclave or a vertical autoclave? Well, there are no marks for answering this question. The next question, actual question is, is it a type N, type S, or a type B autoclave? The next question is, choosing your autoclave. How did you decide to buy your autoclave? Did you follow a senior ophthalmologist? Did you phone a friend or some marketing by a company? Or did you exactly know what you wanted and then you bought it? The third question is, which is this team here? Can you identify which is this team here in this photograph? The next question is probably simple for you all. What are the parameters of doing the CSO in a heart cataract or stuff? This, I think all of you will get correctly, but that's not the question. What is the liquid or water that you use to clean your FACO handpiece? Which syringe do you use to clean your FACO handpiece? What is the minimum amount of water that you use to clean? And how much of air do you flush after this? The next question is, in which part or rack of your sternizer would you like to put your take off probe? Should you put it in the upper part? Should you put it in the middle part? Should you put it in the lower part? Or it doesn't matter. Well, our approach to sterilization has to take a fast probe. We want to eat, get it fast and it's fast. And we all want to know about the A to Z of sterilization within a very short period of time, which is absolutely not possible. Because one protocol will not fit another practice, and we all need to optimize it for our practice. So, what I'll be speaking to you is A, B, C of steam sterilization, which stands for all basic concepts. So, to customize anything, you should first understand the process. Only when you understand the process and its things, then only you can customize it for your. So only when you understand this, you can achieve the correct target. The aim of this talk is to not to give you a ready made answer or knowledge, but to raise the correct questions so that you understand the basics of civilization and to develop a practical approach. Raju, your voice yes, is not audible. No, is it better, sir? Ah, no? Yes, now, now it is okay. okay. Please come forward. Otherwise, yes, we can't hear you at all. Okay, okay. Uh, sterilization yes. process is a probability function. It is not absolute. It is very important to understand that there is a chance of one in a million uh, in this process uh, for surviving this process. So if I ask you the question, do you know how to sterilize? Well, everybody of us will say, yes, I know. Well, is it as simple as this? Does it hold good for a reaction? How did they recommend this value? Does it hold good for an instrument with moving for long paper tubing? Or in which type of ordinance can you use this? Well, our approach to sterilization has been like this. We need to get and forget it. However, it is important we understand the various factors that are affecting this sterilization. That is the amount of organic material, the number of microorganisms to begin with, the presence of biofilm. The air removal methods and the nature of the object, and whether we are doing a wrap or an wrap cycle. Now, how to achieve effective sterilization? So, it's important that we implement a consistent system for lowering and limiting bio burden before sterilization. Properly preparing the instrument before sterilization is as important as sterilization. Sir, once again, voice is breaking. Voice problem. Voice problem. Shall I uh, ask uh, Dr. Rajiv to start his presentation? I'll come back and do this. Sorry. Yes, I no, do. My, mine is uh, pre recorded. I'll just play my recording. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I, can you stop your sharing? Yes, yes, sir. Doctor, I will play. No, no, I'll, I'll play from here. No problem. Okay. 
if i have any problem you just take off i am using the advanced share no? the next topic is cleaning and packing of instruments segregation of the instrument starts right immediately after the theater and uh, hollow or uh, tubing should be flushed immediately after the surgery excessive uh, blood stains or uh, contamination should be cleaned in the theater itself and the instrument is transported to the cleaning area where three tray technique is being used to clean the instruments RO water is sufficient for uh, cleaning of instruments the first uh, tray the mild in disinfectant is added the other two trays uh, just plain RO water is sufficient the instruments are soaked in the disinfectant solution for a while before it is cleaned instrument cleaning solutions are commercially available which contain cetrimide and chlorhexidine adequate time should be given before it is taken out for cleaning this is the wrong way of doing it should not be done outside the solution it should be done within the solution so the proper way of doing inst instrument cleaning is to clean it within the solution which will be demonstrated now this is the wrong way of i'm repeating this is the wrong way when you do it outside aerosolization will occur and contamination can occur so the proper way of cleaning the instrument is within the solution as it is being demonstrated now once it is cleaned in the first solution the same process is done in the second and the third before it is sent for raw uh, drying proper way ultrasonic cleaning is good, very good but uh, use of enzymatic uh, tablets should be avoided because it can cause stars disinfectants are not necessary when uh, using the ultrasonic cleaning devices these are the smaller version of it but make sure it is uh, dry when it is not being used cleaned and dry these are the indicators for the ultra ultrasonic uh, cleaning machine which turns the blue color turns to red once the ultrasonic vibrations are adequate the patency of all the hollow instruments should be checked thoroughly before it is uh, sent for drying and autoclaving this is the simco calina at least 50 ml of the fluid should be used for flushing and check the patency of both the aspiration and the irrigation this is the faco pro the right method is to flush it in the same direction as the flow of the fluid that is the aspiration has to be done this is the wrong way of doing it actually it has to be aspirated in along the faco pro but uh, 100 to 200 ml of uh, this water should be used for cleaning the faco hand piece as well as the ia hand piece and should never pack the instruments wet it should be dried before it is packed this is the wrong way of being packed is shown here dry clean all your instrument wipe clean with lint free cloth air jet is very important to flush the remnants of the water within the tubings and hollow instruments it's very good for uh, faco hand piece as well as the simco calma the instruments are thoroughly dried before it is sent for autoclave air dryer can be used to dry the instruments if you need it urgently check for the 
sharpness, splitting of Wasim core should be checked. Again, with air, the patency is checked. The sharpness is examined underneath the microscope. Silicon sleeve can be applied to scissors so that the sharpness is not affected. It is packed in trays like this and autoclave indicators are inserted into the each tray before it is closed. It is packed in appropriate packing material. The sealing uh, machine is being demonstrated here. The pouch is being sealed before it is sent for autoclave or ETO sterilization. The different packing method is being demonstrated here. This is the parcel method. It is meant for uh, packing instruments for the staff to start the theater. Every edge has got a leading edge. It is bent backwards so that when you open it, you hold the flap so that you don't contaminate the instruments. While opening it, you hold the edge of it so that the inner surface is not contaminated when you are trying to open it. This is the way of packing. This is the envelope method of packing instruments. Looks like an envelope. Here again, there is a leading edge for you to hold the drape when you remove it. This is the envelope. This method is used to introduce a sterile instrument or a pack to a surgical site. So we want to introduce a pack of handpiece to the surgical site. Person handing over can open it up and the proper method of folding the gown. Place it in the way what is being demonstrated like this and fold the back fold into half on either side. Then fold the arm to the front. Then Fold the entire thing into half. Hope you can understand how it is being folded. Then the entire thing is again folded into three as it is being demonstrated here. Now pull the middle part of it, make a W like fold, fold it into four layers. That is the shoulder part which is coming up. Unfold it like this. Pack it. You can tie it up with the tie if you want so that it doesn't open up accidentally. And you can you can see the way how it is worn. Now after outer clay, the staff can just put put your put our hand inside and, and open up it opens up like this. Packing of linen or uh, instruments in a bin is not recommended now, but when you're packing, make sure the bin is dry, moisture free, and should not be packed, tight packed like this. This is the wrong way of doing it. Stuffing into so that the steam may not penetrate adequately. So enough space should be given and it should be in unidirectional manner. So let's see how it has to be packed correctly. Should be in layers, loosely packed one above the other before it is sent. Make sure the openings in the side, the vents are closed, before, open when it is uh, sent for autoclave and uh, should be open at the time of uh, using the pen.
make sure it is open when it is sent for water clear. Now what is being used is the dedicated uh, packing material which can be reused for each set. So for one cataract surgery, one set. That should be the principle which is, will be very useful to prevent end of Dr. Ra Raju has not joined back. Uh, who is the next speaker? Can you take over? Dr. Sumit. Uh, Dr. Sumit. Dr. Sumit, are you there? Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, who's, who's this? Uh, Dr. Raju? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, is your name is written. Oh, okay. Your video is not on. Yeah, yeah I'll just a minute. And it just give me a minute. Yeah, that's fine now. Your voice is very good now. Okay. Some problem with the laptop. I changed my laptop. Yeah, yeah it's very clear. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'll, I'll request probably Dr. Uh, uh, Sanjay sir to speak on ETO, then we'll cover all the sterilization together, steam sterilization together, because otherwise it will get mixed up. Uh, can you do uh, that, Dr. Sanjay? Yeah, yes, sir. mine is pre-recorded. I think that can be played now. Yeah, the admin team, can you do that? Yes, yeah, yeah, right, right. <coughs> I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak on this very important topic of ETO sterilization in ophthalmology practice. Can you go to the slideshow? Yes. Welcome and good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak on this very important topic of ETO sterilization in ophthalmology practice. ETO, also known as ethylene oxide, it's a low temperature method of sterilization used since the 1950s. Very effective, having a good disinfection activity and a very wide range of microbes, including bacterial spores. And the main mode of action is by alkylation of proteins, RNA, and the DNA of the cell. Among the main advantages, some problem. I think it is hung up. It is of ETO it's gas. not playing, I think. Is that it has very good penetrating yeah. power across various packaging materials and into device lumens, especially plastic devices such as tubings. It does not damage temperature and moisture sensitive materials and it does not dull sharps. The equipment is also very simple to operate and monitor and the process is compatible with almost all types of medical materials. In the disadvantages, we have the main one that is it is highly toxic, carcinogenic, explosive and flammable. So we need to take adequate precautions not to let any adverse events happen due to these factors. It has a long cycle time, it is costly than autoclaving and as I mentioned previously, we cannot use this method to sterilize liquids. The ETO cycle consists of five stages, the first of which is called as preconditioning. In this, the humidity in the chamber is increased and the load is brought up to the cycle temperature. Next, the gas is introduced into the chamber either from a cartridge or from a cylinder in the older models. This begins the sterilization phase. In this phase, the gas penetrates into the load, into the items which are kept and then it is also called the holding time or the dwell time ranging from 1 to 6 hours. It is during this time that the actual sterilization is taking place. Once this is over, the evacuation of the gas is done by rapid pulsing of vacuum and air. So most of the E2 is removed in this stage and then this is followed by a long period of what is called as air wash or aeration in which there are further vacuum and air pulses which remove the E2 gas that has been absorbed in the various items kept in the load. Now the manual machines do not have an aeration phase. So natural aeration takes a very long time, anywhere between 2 to 7 days. This increases the turnaround time quite high, whereas in automated machines, the aeration is included as a part of the cycle. It is active process and the material can be used immediately after the cycle is over. So this reduces the turnaround time quite significantly. 
the essential parameters for ETO standardization are these four time temperature relative humidity and gas concentration now you will see that there are ranges for each of these parameters so different vendors they may use different combinations of these parameters so the cycle times can vary from one brand to another so it is better to check this out to get an idea of what will be the turnaround time and the appropriate cost for the cycle in terms of electricity now preparing items for ETO standardization is very very important make sure that all of them are thoroughly clean no organic matter should be left on these items ensure that they are all perfectly dry any water dissolves ETO gas reducing the quantity of gas available for standardization and it also creates a toxic compound called as ethylene glycol okay. pack the items immediately after they are dry and always prefer paper plastic type of packaging we get pouches reels various types so this is what should be preferred for packaging the ETO items for ETO for better gas penetration while you are packing remove the air from the pack as much as possible to allow more gas to enter and also to prevent the accidental opening of the seal because when the gas enters the pack it swells up and increases the pressure in the pack okay. for this use a good seal which should be added 3 to 4 millimeters wide so this is usually given by rotary sealers these are quite costly so you can go in for an ordinary sealer which gives a very narrow seal in that case we should apply three seals close to each other to minimize the accidental opening and of course label the packs on the plastic side do not write on the paper side you can use stickers or you can write with the marker pen also so the labeling should include sterilization date expiry date the batch number and the name of the person who has done the package now giving expiry dates can be usually time related or event related so time related is what is commonly used so a properly sealed and stored pack can have a long expiry of six months to one year sometimes even more also but if you are not sure of the handling and storage conditions or you have not set them up initially give a shorter shelf life and then decide extension by trial and error in your setup okay but at any time if a sterilized ETO pack becomes wet due to any reason or develops tears and perforations or the seal comes open the item should be recleaned and reprocessed immediately it should not be taken as sterile monitoring ETO sterilization is very important and there are three methods physical chemical and biological monitoring all three have to be done so in the physical monitoring using a cycle printout is best for this so you can see the photo of a cycle printout on the right side of the slide so this printout should be checked immediately after the cycle is over even before you open the machine and on the printout check first whether the various phases of the cycle have occurred according to the program and in, then in each phase whether the parameters of time temperature pressure and humidity have been maintained as programmed next type of monitoring is chemical so in the upper photo you can see what we call as a class 1 chemical indicator so this is a very basic indicator often it is built in into the packaging material so this is a class 1 it should be present on every pack every time so, so this basically indicates only exposure to ETO it does not indicate sterilization the lower photo shows you what is called as a multi parameter indicator so these are called as class 4 or 5 indicators so these parameters they will pass only when three or four conditions of sterilization are met for example time temperature and gas so this sort of indicator tells you much better whether the required physical conditions for sterilization were maintained in that chamber or not so these indicators should be used minimum once a week for testing the uh, checking the months to monitoring the sterilization now the important thing here is the colors of the indicators they vary from brand to brand so the staff should know which color to accept and which not to accept this can lead to some confusion if you keep on changing the brands frequently monitoring which is considered to be gold standard is biological monitoring so for this we use bacillus atrophius spores in the quantity of 10 to 6 per indicator so ideally these are to be tested for every ETO cycle but if cost is an issue minimum test recommended testing can be once a week so never forget to do biological indicator testing this is very very important there is another type of monitoring device called as a process challenge device which is a good to have device 
सो दीज आर बेसिकली हॉलो मेटल ट्यूब्स विथ अ मल्टी पैरामीटर केमिकल इंडिकेटर और ए बायोलॉजिकल इंडिकेटर एट वन एंड ऑफ द ट्यूब सो दे गिव अ गुड आइडिया आउ हाउ वेल इट यो पेनिट्रेशन ऑकर्स इन टू लूमेंस इन युअर मशीन द इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग टू रिमेंबर इज दिस पेनिट्रेशन कैपेसिटी कैन वेरी फ्रॉम मशीन टू मशीन इवन फॉर द सेम ब्रांड सो इफ यू आर गोइंग टू स्टरलाइज हॉलो मेटल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स इन योर इटो स्टरलाइजर इट इज डेफिनेटली इम्पॉर्टेंट दैट यू ऑल्सो रन ए पी सी डी अलॉन्ग विद दैट इन द सेम लोड एंड यू फाइंड आउट वेदर द पेनिट्रेशन इज हैपनिंग इन टू दैट लूमेन और नॉट सो दिस इज अ वेरी गुड टू हैव डिवाइस एस्पेशली यू गोइंग टू यूज इफ यू गोइंग टू स्टरलाइज हॉलो मेटल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स the eto exposure limit is usually set at 1 ppm one part per million in the air for the airborne eto gas so this is the limit which above which the gas is dangerous to the human body note also that the odor detection limit is 500 ppm so if you smell the eto gas then you should realize that the by the time you smelt it you have already been exposed for a long period of time so it is always better to use an eto sensor which are now available and they can sense a uh, given audio alarm if the eto concentration in the air goes above 1 ppm so it's a good way instrument to have in your working area so coming to eto toxicity and hazards occupational exposure is often linked to hematologic changes which involves development of various cancers such as lymphomas and leukemias and is also linked to an increased risk of spontaneous abortions okay acute exposure to a significant quantity of gas often leads to mucous membrane irritation fainting convulsions and unconsciousness and other effects chronic inhalation can lead to formation of cataracts cognitive impairment and other cns abnormalities and injuries such as tissue burns are known to happen in patients and these are have been associated with eto residues left over in implants due to inadequate removal of the eto gas so to summarize eto is a proven sterilization method very good effective method but should be used wisely and monitored correctly thank you for your time yeah thank you so uh, thank you dr sanjay uh, that was an, a very informative talk uh, commonly asked question is can we uh, sterilize the feco hand pieces in uh, the eto sterilizer some of them uh, ask this question what is your take on that So my take would be uh, first confirm with the vendor whether they are compatible with ETO sterilization. They should be, and since they are lumen instruments, it is it they can be done. But we should use a PCD in that case along with the PECO hand pieces to find out whether penetration has happened properly or not. Uh, of course, there's a long cycle time. Doctor Rajiv or Doctor Shivram, would you like to come in? Well, sir, it is uh, I quite feel, good. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you I go ahead, sir. That. autoclave is the best method because yes. it doesn't uh, leave the residue and you can use it immediately after cooling eto we cannot use for next 2 to 3 days is it we have to uh, have a shelf life uh, so uh, that's the reason autoclave most of the companies uh, hand pieces fake hand pieces are autoclavable so autoclave is the best method i feel because uh, chemical no chemical residues i agree with that No, the question is: Is it possible to do ETO? Yes, yes surely it, it can be done. But you have, you need the shelf time. Yeah, shelf that's the thing. Because most of the time, uh, yeah. the fake or hand pieces, much will not be there. One or two, many yeah. people will not have much. One and every day surgeries are done. You have to keep for three days or four days. Means it becomes a practically difficult thing. So that's, that's the. the no, that's I, the advice for this is. Long. Can can I add a word to that? Suppose yes, you are having yes. a spare FACO machine, and yes. in case your machine fails, in that case you can have an ETO sterilized uh, handset standby when you are going to use the standby machine. That's then a, a very good indication for a ETO sterilization of handsets. Uh, sir, in that case you can also autoclave the piece in the paper plastic pouch, and it will have a long shelf life. So you can yes, keep sir. it as a standby. and uh, i agree with shivram sir that autoclaving is a much better method so wherever possible we should go for autoclaving but it can be done in eto also if required 
Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, continue with my presentation and I have a, a sorry about the uh, delayed cost. Welcome back. So, yeah. Can you hear me now? Is it okay? Yes, yes, yes. yes. very well, sir. So we are talking about the ABC of steam sterilization that is all basic concepts. So to customize anything, we need to understand the process and run the settings. So then only we can reach our targets. The aim of this talk is to not to give you ready-made answers as I told you. And it's important that we understand that the sterilization is a probability function and is not absolute. Even after you do all these things, there's a chance that one in a million spore can still survive this process. That's what it means. So you know, we all know these uh, various uh, charts that we are all uh, that we all studied during our microbiology days. But is it as simple as this? Does it hold good for a wrapped cycle? How did they recommend this value? How does it hold good for an instrument with lumens or a phaco tubings? And in which type of autoclave do you need to use these settings? Our approach to sterilization has been something like this, fill it, shut it, and forget it. However, it is very important that we understand the various factors that are affecting the sterilization, especially the biofilms and the air removal methods. It's also important to understand the factors like wrapped and unwrapped cycle will lead to changes in your settings when you are doing a sterilization. To achieve effective sterilization, we need to implement a consistent system for lowering the bio burden. As uh, told by Dr. Sukumaran sir, Sukumaran sir, how to clean your instruments, that's the most crucial step when you are doing the sterilization. So we need to establish and implement these controls to maintain the sterility till they are utilized at the OT table. To make it simple, that's what I tell, let's make it equal to cooking. That's how sterilization can be compared to. But if I tell you to just cook, it is childish. So you should always make sure that you clean what you're putting inside your cooker. Something similar is with respect to your sterilization. Sterilization is a multi-step process and proper cleaning is the first step in this process. So you can do the cleaning by various methods that was shown already. Why is cleaning important? Because sterilization is dependent on the contact of the sterile end with the surface. So if your surface of the instrument is soaked with blood or remnants of that, they just get baked on during the sterilization process. Hence, it is very important that we do a proper cleaning before we put it for an autoclave. Now coming to this question, what liquid one should use to clean a FACO handpiece? Well, the answer is, that you should use deionized or distilled water. Which syringe should you use? You should use a 50 ml syringe or a 60 ml syringe. And the minimum quantity of water that is recommended to be flushed in each of these port is 120 ml. You should do. So at least 240 ml should be used for both the ports. And after this, you need to flush it with air that is 60 ml. This is what is recommended in your uh, by the manufacturer. When it comes to the reprocessing, after the surgery, the cleaning should start immediately, then the disinfection, then the sterilization, then the storage. This is how it goes. And the cleaning as told, it should start on the OT table itself. Instrument should never be soaked in saline or sodium hypochlorite. The temperature of the water should be maintained between 27 to 44. Not hot water should not be used because it will lead to coagulation and will prevent removal of the protein substances. So don't use hot water. A manual cleaning, you can use bristles or you can use ultrasonic cleaners. And the cleaning solutions, avoid using detergents and enzymatic cleaners because of the risk of TAS. Non-enzymatic cleaners are preferred. Again, the most crucial step in this cleaning process is the rinsing part of it. So we need to rinse the instruments. A three sink method is sometimes recommended instead of using uh, three bowels because the water that is there is uh, washed off after you clean. The packaging, again, various method, uh, various uh, pouches and paper pouches and paper plastic pouches are available. It's important to seal them correctly. I'll show you why. 
And loading the sterilizer also should be very important. It should not be overloaded so that the steam can reach uh, the uh, all the nooks and corners of your instrument. When you are loading the uh, sterilizer, make sure the paper side is on the on the tray is up on their side and you should always put it plastic to plastic or paper to paper when you are loading it. All the instruments should be in open position. You can use perforated or mesh bottom trays and use absorbent or non linting towel in the bottom of the tray to facilitate drying. Lumen items should be flushed with distilled water immediately before the steam sterilization. Now coming to the how to choose your autoclave, a detailed talk is there by Dr. Shivam sir. But many of us, when we started our practice, usually followed a friend's recommendation. But the correct questions to ask are, what type of instruments are you sterilizing? How many sterilizations are you doing per week? And where you're planning to put your autoclave? The types of autoclave can be based on the class. It can be N class, which is a gravity sterilizer or a S class or a class B autoclave wherein multiple pulsed, pulsed vacuum cycles are available. It's important to remember that the class N cycle, class N autoclaves are not suitable for sterilizing wrapped instruments. When you look at these two large autoclaves, it's a vertical and a horizontal autoclave. Technically, both are same. They are gravity based autoclaves. But when you look at these two autoclaves, which are horizontal autoclaves, there's a difference here. The one on the left side has got a vacuum pump. So you can customize these autoclaves and convert them uh, into a uh, vacuum uh, based autoclave or a class B autoclave. Large sterilizer also available. And even when it comes to smaller autoclaves, these can be of further three types. Again, it could be just a N class or a S class or a class B autoclave. So not the size doesn't matter. It's actually the technology behind it. The technicalities you should understand when you're buying the autoclave. The N class autoclave and the class B autoclave, the important difference is the air removal. The N, in an N class autoclave, the air removal is very poor, but in the class B autoclave, the air removal is good. Why is it important? Let us first try to understand what is steam here. What you are seeing here is actually not the steam. Actually, the steam is an invisible gas. So what you are seeing is the condensation of the water molecules that is seen as a whitish area, what smoke like thing that you're seeing there. So this is the condensation of the water. Why we need to understand this is the steam that is used in sterilization has to come in contact with the colder object and then it condenses. Only when this happens, it transfers the heat energy to kill all the bacteria on the load. So steam is a vehicle to transfer the heat. It is the heat which is doing the job. So what does air do to this heat carrying steam vehicle? It acts like a speed breaker. So the air doesn't allow the steam to reach where it should reach. So this is especially true in a gravity based uh, autoclave wherein the air remains uh, inside the autoclave. So if you see this uh, video here, the steam doesn't allow, the air doesn't allow the steam to reach the nooks and corners. That's why it happens. When it comes to the phases of uh, sterilization, you have the phase one, phase two, and phase three, and phase four. Out of this, the phase three is the most crucial period. That is the holding period. When it happens, that's when the actual sterilization is happening. So when it comes to sterilization, as I told you, when you compare it to a cooking, you can see that various items have got different time to cook. So our FACO items or the FACO hand pieces belong to what is called as the hollow type A load. And this you can think that they are actually the meat when it comes to sterilization. So you require to have the correct cycle and parameters to sterilize these items. So the other variables include whether you are doing a wrap cycle or an unwrap cycle and whether you're using linen or solid instruments. And you should also understand which is the rate limiting step in this. When you're using a hollow instrument, the air removal and the holding period are the rate limiting steps, and these have to be modified accordingly. So based on this, you need to set your time and the temperature. 
So if you look at the uh, recommendation, you can see that the 121 degrees is not validated or given by the manufacturer. So for a gravity displacement, you have to do 132 degrees for 18 minutes. This what is given for the infinity ozil handpiece by Alcon. Again, gas sterilization is specifically written not recommended. And when it comes to using the reusable tubings, it's important what they have written here, we can reuse only up to 20 cases. That's what is mentioned in the book. And if you see here, they give very vaguely, you can use 123 degrees or 132 degrees, but they are not given you what is the holding time in this. So it's important that we should do this by validating the process ourselves. So it's important that we understand what is the holding period and validate it for what we are in whatever instruments that you are putting into the autoclave. So in conclusion, sterilization is a probability function. We need to everything possible so that we comply with the best practices, not some of the time, not most of the time, but all the time to achieve uh, effective sterilization. Thank you very much. That was a very nice presentation, precise one. Very good, Dr. Raju. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next part of uh, after you cook something is to taste it to know how it is, whether it is cooked correctly or not. That is what uh, Dr. Sumit Kanduja will be telling us to, to know how exactly whether what you have autoclaved has gone through the correct process and whether it is safe to use it. Dr. Sumit, please. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Fine, fine, fine. Thank you, Sumit. Presenting in front of you always makes me feel like a JR in front of a senior resident. That palpitation, that tension is always there. No problem. So I'll just start, sir. Give me a moment. Sir, is my screen visible or not? No, visible, visible. Yes, visible. visible. And I am audible, sir? Yes. yes. Okay. Sir, going ahead from what Dr. Raju just taught us, uh, is the validation, I'll be speaking on the validation of the steam sterilization process. And some of the points will be an overlap of uh, Sir's presentation. So, uh, as we know that sterilization is a process that effectively it kills or eliminates uh, pathogens from surfaces, instruments, food, etc. Now, this is uh, the concept uh, of sterilization, but what actually uh, we get statistically what we are aiming is for a sterilization assurance level because nobody can say that uh, the probability of organism surviving will be zero. So as Sir uh, told in the previous presentation, the accepted industry norm is that it should be less than one per one million that is the chance of a pathogen surviving that is the uh, final aim now if you see what does validation mean it means the action of checking or proving the accuracy or making something uh, legally or officially acceptable right so the uh, diagram on the right is a picture from the htm uh, guidelines on uh, autoclaving and i'll be just telling a little bit of it uh, see, the if you act, we go actually into the guidelines of validation, they are very broad. But what is most relevant to us, I'll be trying to uh, present in the most simple form. That the validation or the uh, qualification process, uh, the initial is the installation qualification, second is the operational, and third is the performance. Now, what uh, each of these terms mean is that the first is installation qualification. And this is exactly the way professional agencies which go on to validate a new autoclave or uh, an old autoclave which is already installed. That is how they go. That first, that the autoclave should be installed as per the manufacturer's guidelines. This uh, whole concept is more of has got more of engineering. That means you're getting water at the right uh, TDS. You have a single phase or a three-way supply. 
and this concept is generally used for large ssds the ones that we use in ophthalmic setups are uh, generally compatible with most of the uh, sources that we have in our uh, single doctor setups then once you have installed the autoclave as per the manufacturer's guidelines in terms of you have given the water supply uh, and uh, the uh, electricity supply is there the second is the operational qualification operational qualification means that the uh, autoclave is working at the exact specifications it is supposed to work and it has been set the at the guidelines which have been set by iso and have been printed in the manual it is like that you are decided to purchase a car you are just taking one final test ride of that vehicle now what do what are the three common tests that we do one is the vacuum leak test second is the bovidic test and third is the heat distribution test okay you must have heard of the first two terms that is the vacuum leak test the bovidic test in heat distribution test i'll not be elaborating it is something that is done with the help of uh, your third party agencies there are agencies in india as well now which uh, validate your autoclave what they do is that they will get thermocouples which will be installed at various places in the autoclave and they will see that the autoclave temperature if it is being set at 121 degrees it reaches 121 degrees and uh, there are no cold spots in the autoclave so uh, this has, has to be done by specialized agencies the i'll be talking of the first two tests which you can do in source in house and you should know the first is the vacuum leak test now you know that in class b autoclaves what happens is that there is a vacuum the vacuum is that it is actively the air is actively aspirated out okay and then when the vacuum builds up the steam it gets introduced and it occupies the vacuum which is created inside your instruments inside the linen everything now this test is there uh, the idea of this is that there is no leakage in the rubber gasket of your autoclave or at any other place and because that any air that will enter now into the autoclave will be an unfiltered air and it will compromise the sterilization process the recommended guideline is that uh, you have to do three consecutive cycles and for example this was our autoclave we we have one autoclave in our the, in our medical college so this is how it uh, you know there is a module for that and uh, the leak test module so you just press that button and at the end of it it will give at the end of 30 minutes it will give a print out that the leak test is passed or it is failed so in this case it was a failed test i have highlighted it the second is the bovidic test uh, uh, nabh accreditation has taught us a lot about uh, these things what happens now this bovidic test what you do is that you paste the uh, the test sheet along with its pack now this has to be placed in very good just a second okay so this has to be placed near the drain of the autoclave so on my right the autoclave this is around a, a 300 liter autoclave uh, it has got a drain which has been circled for aspirating out the air it has it is said that you keep it 100 mm that is 10 cm above this drain and this is a smaller autoclave there is a pipe at the back which actually sucks out the air and you have to because it is said that the steam is least likely to reach this spot the point of active aspiration so you place the bovidic sheet and the color uh, here it is the untreated sheet is orange and the treated one is black that is how it should go that it gets the color changes at 121 degrees for 17 minutes and this should be uh, done as the first thing in the morning every day you do and it indicates complete air removal even if you are not doing a leak test the bovidic test is a surrogate marker for the leak test can it be done for gravity dependent autoclaves yes there is no prohibition it uh, if your gravity dependent autoclave is able to remove the air pockets completely there will be a change in the color so as i told you about the heat distribution study this is generally done by third party agencies you they use thermocouples which are placed at various places in the chamber and uh, a 2 degree division is unacceptable 
now the third is your performance qualification what does performance qualification mean you have bought an autoclave it is the i the manufacturer says it is as per iso guidelines you have run all these tests in an empty autoclave there is no leakage the steam is penetrating well but now we have to see that how actually this autoclave is going to work when i have loaded it with my uh, linen or my instruments or my other packs so that is the final test so there is another test which is called the heat penetration but let me talk about first the biological indicators that you know about you will use for performance quality now you know that the these biological indicators they are there for steam they are for heat dry heat for eto but if you look on my right on the right you see in the, in the arrow two things written one is number of viable organisms and second is the d value which for the uh, organism that is bacillus stereothermophilicus is 1.5 to 2.5 minutes now just to tell you a little bit <clears throat> what does it mean d value it basically refers to the time at any particular temperature for example 121 134 132 which it takes to kill 90% of microorganisms so that means that if you start with 100 colony forming units at the end of the d value time you will have 10 left if you start with 1000 at the end of the d value time you will have 100 value now d121 that is the time out 121 degrees to kill 90% of the spores these hardy spores is approximately 2.5 minutes so what we have to do is now you cannot assume that so what we have to understand is that the time of autoclaving that means which is required to kill the microbacteria and to achieve a sterilization acceptance level will vary with the uh, actual load the biological load uh, the, of the instru um, of the pathogens uh, in the material that is to be sterilized so what we actually do is that we assume that the biological load uh, is 1 lakh 10 raised to power 6 so what happens that at the end of 2.5 minutes you are left with 10000 pathogens Sorry, hundred thousand. Then at the end of five minutes, with ten thousand, thousand at seven point five, and then so on. So what happens at the end of seventeen point five minutes? You are left fifteen minutes. You are left with one pathogen theoretically, and at the end of thirty minutes, you are left with a chance of one in one million, which is called the sterilization assurance levels. So what this means is that you have to run twelve cycle logs or twelve cycles. of the d time to achieve to have a chance that you have got the spore of bacillus stereothermophilicus of surviving 1 in 1 million and hence you say that for steam sterilization we will use a temperature of 121 degree centigrade or 250 fahrenheit for 30 minutes and this is called the concept of overkill so that is precisely what we will do that we will keep the biological indicator in the same way in the same type of wrapping as we would keep our critical instruments and we will keep it in the spot which is called the weakest spot of the autoclave that is just near the drain and then we will run the cycle okay when i go for generally i am also an nabh assessor when i go to for inspections i often find hospitals very afraid they are mostly using chemical indicators if you ask them about biological indicators they say ki sir yes we use it and we send it to the lab for those people who are attending those who know it is good for those who do not know let me just tell you that this is a biological jo uh, this is actually a biological indicator of eto i got in hand but just explain just to tell you that this is how a biological indicator uh, bottle vial it looks like when you open it up there is a small white culture medium at below and then this is a test tube which uh, this is a tube which contains the spores and you see a white thing in my hand that is actually a crusher of these tubes so what you do is that once you uh, have uh, taken these tubes you have put them in the autoclave 
you take them out you put them in this crusher so what you see in the plastic has got compressed and the tube has kind of got crushed so just to tell you this is the photograph on the left you could see the meniscus of the glass vial and on the right it is now crushed so it has got basically mixed with the culture medium so for biological indicators of autoclaving you uh, intubate it at 56 degrees for 48 hours and this is a color change from purplish it has changed to yellowish this indicates that the spores are growing and it is not a good thing so as a for performance qualification there should be no growth of in any of the biological indicator at various spots that you have put some people are not able to wait for 48 hours now there are super rapid sterilizers which can give you in the report in 24 hours i also recommend you doing a process challenge device using because we are using hollow long tube instruments this is basically an indicator that you fold and you put it in a tube at the end of a tube and this you can put along with your phaco emulsification tubing to see actually if the color is changing it it is a 1.25 meter long tube it will tell you whether the seam is able to percolate through the tubing and reach the autoclave indicator or not so just to uh, these are the last few slides because i talked about biological indicators just a little bit about the chemical indicators that uh before we were there are six types six classes of chemical indicators and uh, the type 1 is called process indicators this does not tell whether the material has been autoclaved or not it just tells it has been exposed type class 2 are specific use indicators what we call as the bovidic indicators these are used to test for the percolation of steam uh whether the vacuum has been uh, sorry the air pockets have been removed or not then we have class 3 indicators which are bivariable we have got three variables that is temperature one is pressure and uh, other is time so this indicates for time and pressure sorry uh, temperature and pressure not time then four uh, sorry uh, and uh, five and six they are tri variable indicators they tell you for all the parts of the cycle that is time pressure and um, temperature and these are the ones which are closest to the biological indicators but i would strongly encourage you most i have hardly seen hospitals use uh, biological indicators most of them stop at chemical indicators do not be hesitant i have in the last two slides that i have uh, dedicated i want wanted everyone to be at ease with using biological indicators so these are some of the uh, uh, as a ending slide because uh, it was a take home message that uh, what it can be the validation schedule of an uh, installed autoclave so it is that daily you do bovidic test as the first test of the day and then for your uh, further autoclaving uh, uh, cycles you use chemical indicators weekly you can use a vacuum leak test and use uh, biological indicators in your uh, cycles quarterly you have to get uh, uh, quarterly you have to do a temperature and pressure gauge calibration uh, using a thermocouple and that has to be done essentially with the help of an agency which specializes the cost is approximately around 10000 for one uh, calibration and temperature distribution and yearly you do get your servicing done by the oem and ask him to specifically look out for uh, non -con uh, condensable gas test steam superheat and uh, steam dryness test thank you so much uh, thank you sumit uh, that was an excellent presentation that i have heard uh, on uh, validation you gave a very beautiful overview of how you should systematically do the things thank you very much due to paucity of time we'll move on to the next uh, two talks i would request dr nidhi patwadan uh, to uh, take us uh, to our presentation as to how to deliver the sterile objects uh, without any mistakes on the ott table sir do i share the screen yes yes okay at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic the earlier presenters have already talked about the various methods of sterilization 
and the various methods to track crystallization. So the purpose of this presentation is practically when the surgeon actually enters the operating room, how can we be sure that the sterilization protocols have all been followed? Because any breach can lead to the infections. So we have uh, we know that there are various methods of quality control. We can how can we track the sterilization? Include the uh, mechanically means by physically noting down everything and also the chemical indicator. So we have to make sure that our staff is doing this job and every autoclave, every uh, ETU cycle is properly noted along with the indicator in some or the other form. Like in this case, we can note it in the registers and the person who is noting it down has, should sign it. So there should be accountability. There should be a single person responsible for each process. Because we know that everybody's responsibility is nobody's responsibility. And in case there is any kind of uh, breach in the protocol, we should be able to track who is uh, and which process is responsible for this breach. The chemical indicators, the most commonly used ones are the class 1 and the class 5 indicators, we know. And the class 1 are the ones which uh, only differentiate between the processed and the unprocessed uh, items. Whereas the class 5 is more advanced and it is telling us whether the process is effective or ineffective. So uh, if the class 5 is better, so why do we use class 1 indicators? Because it is a cheaper one for the outside uh, materials such as cotton swabs and the buds. We can use class 1 indicators and because it saves on the cost. The two important tests which have been uh, talked about but which are commonly missed are the Bovidix test and the Helix test. The Bovidix test is a test which is used to check whether the air has been removed properly before the use of the autoclave in a pre sterilizer because the, uh, the air needs to be completely removed so that the steam can penetrate inside the porous material for proper sterilizer. And there are, uh, the indicator should change uh, its color properly to know that the autoclave is working properly. The other test, you have which so the other test is the helix test, which is to test whether the sterilization has properly penetrated the hollowed instrument. In this, we put the indicator in the helix tube, and in the helix tube is put in the same uh, box in which we are putting the other uh, our hollow instruments. And after the autoclave is complete, we check whether the indicator has changed colors or not. Which indicates that the sterilization has reached the proper hollow uh, lumen of the instruments. So now we are checking whether the indicator has changed the color. Friends, I am Dr. Saurabh Patwadhan from the Dari Fakeways ICS Training Institute and PG Institute, Sangli, Maharashtra, India. And in this video, I will be speaking about the sterilization. So, how a surgeon can track the sterilization process? Uh, so, as a surgeon, when I enter the operating room, so there are a few things which uh, we must notice. These are very important things uh, so that our surgeries are safe for our patients. So first thing I have written is the OT validation. You can see this is the last date when it was validated and this is the due date. So the moment I walk in, I should know that uh, whether the OT has been validated. See, this validation is mainly for the air handling units which uh, we put with the HEPA printers. So for that, this is very important because if even if you have the best air handling unit with HEPA printer, if it is not properly validated and not properly maintained, it is as risky. The last one was taken on this date and you can see the due date is within uh, a month. So the moment this due date is passed and I can see that the last date has not been changed, I know that it has not been done. So this is another important thing and the biological indicators which are must for each sterilization equipment. So every autoclave, every ETO machine or plasma sterilizer that you have, you must uh, check these biological indicators every week. So every week the biological indicators must pass. If they have failed, you, you should stop using that particular equipment and make sure you get it repaired so that it is safer for our patients. Uh, this is another chart you can see. 
these are this is a chart of indicators so this part shows before the procedure what was the color of the indicator and what how it is after the procedure because we are using uh, different types of indicators and the batches may change afterwards so every assistant and every surgeon should know when the ETO indicator or the uh, autoclave indicator with whether it is successfully passed the process or not you have to also watch for the date or batch number data in indicators these uh, this data uh, date will tell you whether it has been used just once or if sometimes it is by mistake used again then we may have false the process of the little material uh, where the, the process indicator was not removed from the initial Maybe we are not able to hear you. With the palpation, the uh, swimming, that the OT that you are operating in, and the uh, sterilization equipment like autoclave and ETO are already validated with the validation, the uh, swabs, and the biological indicators. Now we are going to start the surgery. So as the surgeon enters the operation theater, how can he track whether what all the sterilization procedures which were done outside in a sterilization department whether they have been complete or not was it effective or was there some breach in the sterilization procedure so we'll see about that so uh, we can get either the equipments which are already pre-sterilized that is they come with the disposable pack such as we have cassettes and uh, there are a few instruments or equipment or devices that we pre-sterilize in our facility so first start off with how we are going to put up all this in our peco machine so uh, this is already a cassette which comes in the pre-sterilized format. So the assistant just has to open it and uh, give it to the OT assistant, my surgical assistant, who is going to assemble it on the machine. So uh, before we put the irrigation bottle in, okay, we have to examine the irrigation bottle, look for any particulate matter against the light, okay, and uh, then you have to attach it to the FECO machine. So, uh, for the touch screen, we are going to use the screen covers, which we have into sterilized for. Uh, this is the into sterilized plastic. So, we are going to see the indicator over the plastic before applying it over the screen. The next step will be to attach the FECO probe and the tubing to the uh, FECO machine. Now, because FECO probe we are going to reuse, it has been already sterilized. And this time we have used uh, into sterilization process, but we can also use the B class autoclave. Now, if you see the pack, there are there is one indicator which is thin here. This is a class one indicator. So class one indicator just tells you that this is the processed uh, FECO probe, but it will not tell you whether the process has been effective or not. And for that, we have another indicator, class five indicator, which is inside the box. Now this is a ETO pouch, and we have double packed it just to be more cautious about any physical damage to this plastic cover which is there. Of course, before we open it, we generally physically inspect it to look for any damage. So if the outer cover is damaged anytime, you have to discard it and re-sterilize it. So we'll just show you how it is opened and then given to the assistant. And the assistant will then watch for the class 5 indicator inside only when it is showing that the sterilization has been effective. That FECO probe will be used for the surgery. So even for each instrument set, which we are going to sterilize, there will be a class one indicator on the outside so that we know that the, this surgical load is processed. And second, there will be a class five indicator inside each and every instrument set that we are going to use for different patients. So this is to ensure that each and every instrument set which has gone into the, for the sterilization has passed the entire process, so which is very important. Apart from that, even the things which we may not be actually using intraocularly, they might be extraocular, such as maybe the scissors for cutting the drapes or maybe putting a iPad. You can see that we have applied class one indicator as well as we have used the class one indicator of the Tyvek pouches. This is to ensure that each of these instruments are also processed and we do not use any unprocessed uh, material by mistake. Few things which are often missed. One of the important tip for autoclave use is always use class B autoclave, which has multiple pre vacuum cycles for hollow instruments. And PE test every day in the first cycle is must. 
because that indicates that the equipment is functioning properly. Another important test which is overlooked is the PCD helix test where a tube is placed with the indicator at the one end. So it has to be placed along with any tube which you want to ETO or autoclave so that only if this test has passed you have to use that tube. So these are the important steps in tracking the sterilization and for the safe OR. The first is the OT validation, OT swabs, biological indicators, then check the irrigation solution and other packs physically. Always use class one indicator on the outside of the pack and class five indicator inside of the pack so that you know that the complete effective process of sterilization has been done on that particular instrument. For more such videos, do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. At the outset, I uh, Thank you, Dr. Nidhi <coughs> and Dr. Saurabh for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, it was indeed uh, uh, a very nice video to help uh, the newcomers in, who are starting a practice to understand how exactly one should do this and understand and uh, do these processes in the correct way. With that, uh, we'll move on to the last talk. Uh, that is uh, how to choose your sterilization equipment. We have a very experienced uh, uh, doctor amongst us, Dr. Shivaram. Uh, he will be uh, speaking to us about how to choose your sterilization equipment. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I will be speaking on choosing right sterilizer for your practice. By definition, sterilization is a process that effectively kills or eliminates almost all microorganisms, including spores. Most commonly used are steam sterilizer, that's autoclave, and ETO. Ideal sterilization method requires effective, safe, easy to monitor, with quality assurance, good penetration, and adoptable and approved by the authorities. It should be of shorter cycles, proved material compatibility, and expanded instrument capacity, eco-friendly, low temperature, as well as reduced cost. Autoclave has advantage of low cost, fast cycle, relatively simple, and without any chemical residues. And ETO has an excellent penetration with low temperatures and kills by alkalization. To choose a, a sterilizer, following things to be noted, like the load, budget, space available, and type of surgeries, that's anti-segment surgeries only, or VR surgeries also. In the autoclave, B class with pre vacuum cycle is the best. Tabletop or floor base depends on the load and budget. You can mix and match. That means tabletop, which is relatively economical, can be used for surgical instrument and vertical autoclave for linen. What are the criteria for choosing the autoclave? The size. As I said, it depends on the load plan. Quality of mission, a good branded one with good track record is better. Regarding service issue, we need to discuss about this from the users of our own surgeons for a few years about the good service and availability of space. And we should look at the parameters and cycles available also before we start autoclaving for surgeries once the installation is over the validation of the machine with biological indicator bovidic test as well as pcds that's process challenging devices is must coming to the sizes of b class autoclave the tabletop model typically comes from 20 to 45 liters in that 4 to 12 cataract sets can be autoclave yeah, and generally cost ranges from around 4 lakhs up to 8 lakhs depending upon the size and the brand. The floor models 
where we can articulate the instruments as well as linen ranges between 85 to 250 liters and certain bigger models also come for other uh, purposes the cost begins around 20 lakhs and up to 45 lakhs for 250 liters apart from the autoclave machine we need to look into the other related instruments like ultrasonic cleaner compressed air guns especially for luminous instruments for drying packing and sealing instrument and also arvo filter for water even though we have best of the autoclave machine the basic step for effective sterilization remains same like pre-soaking cleaning by proper scrubbing ultrasonic cleaning drying corrosion control proper lubrication in the joints packaging sterilization monitoring and record maintenance most importantly continuous updating and training the, and monitoring the staff is also important ideal future plan should be multiple hospitals or surgeons can pool resources and starts centralized sterilization center on cooperative sharing basis with best of the equipment maintained and transported in closed containers by dedicated trained staff to conclude choosing sterilizer depends on load budget and area moist heat sterilization that is autoclave with pre-vacuum cycle remains gold standard adding eto is better if posterior segment surgeries are also planned ultrasonic cleaner packing and sealing machine compressed air gun for drying and RO water purifier will strengthen the sterilization process. There is need to emphasize on improvement in cleaning, disinfection, monitoring, documentation and training staff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shavaram sir, for an excellent uh, guide to all of us as to how you should choose your autoclave. Uh, before we wind up, uh, I would uh, like to uh, ask Dr. Uh, Sanjay Kulkarni, sir, because he's a microbiologist amongst us, uh, to quickly give some uh, important take-home messages based on his experience of seeing mistakes in ophthalmic practice. And finally, uh, one more comment by Dr. Rajesh Kumaran, sir, the chairman of the session, to close uh, the session. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, over my experience of many hospitals, the uh, common mistakes that I see in uh, instruments cleaning and sterilization are first thing, the protocols are not known to the staff, so they have to be trained. Training is the most important part. Secondly, we need to set up protocols for pre-cleaning properly. In most of the hospitals, because of space restrictions, the cleaning area is often compromised and the cleaning protocols are not uh, suitable. Thirdly, use of chemicals and disinfectants like enzyme cleaners or detergents. There are various options. We can use enzyme cleaners. We can do without them also. So each hospital needs to set up its own protocols. Next, I often see uh, mistakes in the actual cleaning protocol like uh, Raju Sir had showed a video of brushing being done outside the solution. So many hospitals, they uh, hold the instrument below the tap and they do the brushing. So that is a wrong method. Then protection of the person who they should be wearing lattice gloves, rubber gloves, etc. Okay. Next is the choice of the equipment. So many hospitals they do not know the difference between a class N, class B autoclave. So often these wrong machines are used. Packing materials often our cloth is used, which is quite porous and does not maintain sterility. Next, there is an issue of many people not knowing how to give expiry dates. So that depends on the packaging and the storage conditions and handling after the sterilization. So overall, we need to do a lot of training of CSSD in, in many hospitals. And there are many fine points, like uh, example of use of indicators, for example. They do not know how to, uh, how frequently to use which indicator, which should be placed where. So there are common mistakes which happen. But the thing is, sterilization processes that are designed to take into account these mistakes. For example, uh, Dr. Khandujia talked about overkill. So when we have 12 devalue cycles, like 30 minutes, the process is naturally designed 
to give you more than a six block reduction. So what happens is if there are any minor mistakes, we often don't end up with any infections. So it gives a false sense of security that what we're doing is right. So yes. we should review what we're doing. That is what we might have suggested. Thank Every you. hospital should review in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay and Dr. Rajiv, sir, for their quick uh, and closing comments. Yeah, yeah. Just a minute left. Okay, let me thank. Uh, it was a wonderful session. And uh, Dr. Raju very well anchored the session. And I should thank uh, Dr. Ilan Kumaran for giving me this opportunity. I really enjoyed being with you all. Thank you so much for the invite. Dr. Dr. Zamina, you wanted to make a comment? Sorry, I. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, congratulate you. It was a wonderful session. I just want to bring out two points which are uh, generally missed uh, when we're talking about autoclave and the water which is used. So about the yeah. autoclave, when we buy a pre-vacuum autoclave, like uh, Dr. Shivram said, which is ideal, you should always, always ask your, uh, the, the, the person, the uh, manufacturer to validate the autoclave. And if you're using, if you're autoclaving your tubules, you know, for the vitrectomy and all and using, he has to give you a validation certificate saying what lumen size tubule and what length the vacuum will be completely cleared so that the steam enters and there is a proper kill kinetics. So validation of the machine to be given at installation, very important. Secondly, if you're using distilled water, it should be your own distilled water making unit. You cannot use those distilled water in cans. For the autoclave, you can use, but for washing instruments, you better use RO water filter and don't think that the huge cans of distilled water, what you get and you open it and you keep opening it and using it, that's all contaminated. You really cannot use that. So thank you so much, Dr. Raju, for giving me this chance, okay. but I really enjoyed the session and congratulations to all. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You all. Yeah.